Hey there, my name is Asia, and we are so glad that you are taking the time to watch a message from Connect Church. We hope that you like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Also, to learn more about us, visit connect417.com. Hey, Connect Church, how are you this morning? It is great to see you. We're excited that you're in the room, whether you're on site or watching online. Thank you so much for taking the time to make today a priority. Some of you are energized and ready. Look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you and say, you look so good. Oh, you look so good. Well, we are excited that we can be here together. If you're a guest today, my name is Mark, and it's my privilege just to share the Word of God today. And we are continuing in a series uh, on the book of James in the New Testament. And if you didn't know this, James is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, the book of James is believed to be the first book of the New Testament written, and it was written to an audience of brand new followers of Jesus Christ. And so it was a really cool thing because James is talking to people who were very religious. It wasn't that they didn't have a religious background. Most of us probably have had a religious background. But what he was trying to do is help them realize that in Christ, there is more than just religion. There is a relationship. There is a life that comes through that relationship that's so special. And one of the key things that I think James tries to point out to us and wants us to know early on, it's kind of an overarching theme, is this. Your new life with Christ should look different than or different from your old life before Christ. Something should change in our lives. And in fact, what he would say is this. If it doesn't look different, he says in James chapter 2, it's probably not a real faith. And so it's so important. That's why he wrote this book. That's why he wanted to instruct new believers. Uh, I alluded to this uh, a few weeks ago in this, uh, one of the messages I preached on James where I said, I kind of believe that James is like the basic training or boot camp of Christian faith, where people who are coming in, they've enlisted in this new faith, and now they need to be taught the principles, the basics, the things about faith. And that's what James does. In fact, I even said, James is our drill sergeant. So he is trying to instruct us so we don't get mad. We're not going to get upset. How many of you think the best thing to do with the word of God is to listen to what it says and apply what it says? And sometimes it's going to tell us things we don't want to hear, right? And we can reject it. But the best thing we can do is listen, uh, hear it, and do something with it. So that's our goal today. We're going to jump back in in James chapter 4, verse 6. I want to encourage you to take out your Bible if you have one with you or take out your phone, turn it on, turn on the Bible app, and you can take some notes along with us today. So the big thought that I want uh, for this whole message today, the big idea that I want you to walk away with is this, that real faith is visible, becomes visible through our humility and our honor, the humbleness that we walk in and the way that we honor other people. I don't know if you've seen this before or realized it, but I think these are two words we don't use very often in our culture today. Humility is not something, I, it's, I haven't had many conversations where someone said, you know what, my life goal is just to be really humble. No, most of us, our life goal sometimes, whether we admit it or not, is to get on top of the heap, to be seen most, to be most visible, for people to know who we are, to get ahead. And humility is this different thing. It's not so much that we have to think less of ourselves, it's just that we have to think more of God and more of others around us and how we honor them. And James he kind of knew that this was a problem, not only then, but a problem in mankind going forward. He made this statement in verse six. He says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he's paraphrasing uh, Proverbs chapter three, where this same verse is listed. And what I want you to notice is this. What is the opposite of humility? It's pride. Yeah. Pride. And what is pride? There's a lot of ways you could define pride. There's some good things, like I'm proud of my kids right? That's a, a pride that's healthy. But there's other pride, a demeaning arrogance or a self-reliance or self-trust. And it says here that God opposes the proud. That's some pretty strong language. And I thought to myself, what, how could I give you a visualization that would help you realize what that looks like? How many of you ever remember at any time in your life, maybe when you were in elementary school, playing tug of war? right? You get on one end of each rope. There's a group on this end and a group on this end. How many of you, whenever it got time to play tug of war, how many of you could kind of tell which side was going to win? 
How did you know? You knew because Big Tommy was on the end of that rope. <laughs> Big Tommy was the kid that in seventh grade looked like he was an 11th grader, right? Looked like he should be playing high school football. And your thought probably was, how do I get on the end of the rope with Big Tommy? Because if I'm on Big Tommy's side, he's on my side, I win. This is as though you're on the wrong side of the rope. God's on the other end and he's saying, if, if you're not humble, I oppose that. I'm against that. I'm working against you because I'm trying to pull you across the line from your pride to a place of humble submission. That's a very powerful statement that challenges us, but we see that God chooses to reward humility. It says he gives grace to the humble. He goes on to say this, verse seven, very next verse. So humble yourselves, humble yourselves before God. Uh, in the Amplified Bible, it says submit to the authority of God. Why do I say we need to choose humility? Because I believe humility is a choice. I think we should choose humility because only you can submit yourself to God. Only you can humble yourself before God. Only you can say, God, I give myself to you. And I've heard people say before, and I, I think they meant well, but I, it's a dangerous prayer that I wouldn't pray. They would pray, God, I need your help. Will you just humble me? Two prayers you don't pray. Don't pray, God, humble me, and don't pray for patience. Right? In the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of stories where God came in and humbled people, right? That didn't want to humble themselves. That's why he says, if you want to do it the right way, humble yourself before him. And it says that as we humble ourselves before him, God, he gives us the authority that we need and the power that we need to fight the real battle that we're in against the enemy of our soul, that we can reject him and he will flee from us. And then we jump down to verse 10 and he carries this humility over and he says again, I don't even know when you see something said twice in three verses, you probably should perk your ears up. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. This is just the backwards approach to life. It's so against what we think. We think we will be honored when we exalt ourselves. But scripture says it's this upside down kingdom that as we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. Listen, the person that God exalts can't be knocked down by anybody else. And the only person that can knock us from that place of being exalted by God is ourselves by losing our humility. And so he says that if we will humble ourselves before him, he will raise us up. What does it mean to humble ourselves before God? It's this idea of, of bowing low before him. Let me give you that visual again. He's the king of our soul. We bow low before him and our mind says, I don't want to be the servant. I don't want to be mastered, but you don't get it. He's a good, good father. He's a good king. And when we humble ourselves before him, he raises us humility and honor. And so James goes from this thought and he jumps into three scenarios that were very likely happening in that day and that also are happening today in the life that we live. Three things that he says, listen, these things could really trip up your faith. These things could really mess up your walk with God. In fact, I don't know what your Bible says, but many of the Bibles uh, that, that I've seen have subheadings over each section. These next three sections start with the word warning. How do you know when someone says, hey, I got a warning for you? What do you do? You slow down, you listen up, because they're trying to guard you, protect you, and help you. And so as we listen today, I'm fully aware that the things we're going to look at that James pointed out they're going to force us to evaluate our own hearts, our own minds, the way we think and the way that we live. And how many of you know sometimes evaluating those things becomes very difficult when what we believe is different than what God believes? Because the Holy Spirit wants to change us. So I want to challenge us today. We're still going to have fun. We're still going to dive into the Word of God. But sometimes the Word of God kind of hits us between the eyes and makes us reevaluate what we've done. And so I just want you to keep an open heart. Can you do that with me? Let's listen to what God has to say to us because James, he's not trying to hurt us. He's trying to get us ready for the fight that we're in. 
with an enemy that wants to take us out. And he's saying, you've already got an enemy that wants to take you out. Don't take yourself out by being prideful and dishonoring other people. So let's look at these things. The first warning that he lists is a warning against judging others. A warning against judging others. What does he mean by that? Let's look at this next verse. Verse 11. He's just talked about humility, right? We didn't change chapters. We're one verse later. This is what he says. Don't speak evil against each other, brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. Now, you may remember that back in chapter two, James taught about this idea that we, it, it, it too was listed as a warning. It warned us against being people who showed favoritism and prejudice toward other people. He warned us about how we treat others. And specifically, he was talking about people who were outside the, the, the realm of faith, people that were not believers. People, he's saying that when they come into the church, don't treat them less than because they don't look like they have money or they don't come from the right class or the right people group or whatever. He says, show everybody love. And we know that no matter, no matter where we are, that applies, right? We love people. God didn't call us to criticize them or, or to put them off in different groups. We're just to love people. But right here, I want to be clear. Who is James addressing in this passage? He's not addressing people outside the church because he says brothers and sisters. He's addressing people inside the church. He's addressing those who have made a decision to follow Christ and who are now on the same team. Come on, somebody. They've enlisted in the same army. They're, they have a common goal and a common purpose. And he, he steps in and he has a warning for them. I read this passage and I think to myself, why do Christians find it so easy to criticize other Christians? Why, why do we find it so easy to, to harshly judge someone else's intentions without even having a conversation with them? to judge their motives. Well, I think they meant this. Are you a mind reader? How many know we've all done it? Yeah. Why do we find it so easy to say harsh and hurtful things to other believers? Oftentimes, not even to their face, but to others. Why, why do we act so self-righteous? And James, he says, look, you need to watch yourself. You need to guard yourself because this isn't just you attacking the other person. This is you violating Jesus's teaching. You're, you're positioning yourself again because at the root of this type of thing is pride. And what does God oppose? Pride, the proud. He's saying, so you need to be careful because he says you're violating his teaching. He says you're criticizing and judging God's law. How did Jesus summarize and define all the law? Love God and love people. How loving are we being when we attack people with our words? How loving are we being when we have to make them smaller so that, come on, we can feel bigger? That's the core of pride. Now, listen to me today. Listen closely. Does, does scripture tell us to have a discerning heart about truth? Yes. That we're to judge truth that we're to judge. If someone says to me, you know what? I'm cheating on my spouse, but I think God's okay with that. No, 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 no. We're going to judge truth real fast. Scripture says this. You're telling me that you think God's okay with it. I'm telling you he's not, not because I, I'm angry at you because God's word. Well, I, I told a lie, but it wasn't a big lie. It didn't hurt anything. So God's okay with it. No, we're going to judge truth. Do you understand what I'm saying today? We're to judge truth, but we need to be very careful. It's so important to never forget this thought. We judge truth, not people. We judge truth, not people. You see, criticizing believers. Remember, we enlisted in the same army, right? You may be Navy. I may be Air Force. You may be Marines, but we're on the same side, right? You may be Baptist, you may be Methodist, you may be Lutheran. If you believe the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, we're on the same side. I don't have time to spend my life criticizing what everybody else is doing. It doesn't build the kingdom. 
I'm reminded, I've used this statement two or three times in the last few weeks. I'm reminded, if you remember in the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. They've been in exile and he wants to build back the wall around Jerusalem. God led him to do that. He's asked the king to do that. He has permission to do that. Other Jewish believers are harassing him about building the wall. They're attacking him. Same team attacking him. And here's the paraphrase of his response. These two guys come, hey, you need to come down from building the wall because we want to tell you how wrong you are at building the wall. And he looks at the two of them and goes, I don't have time to come down and talk to you. I'm busy about the work of the Lord building the wall. I don't have time. Listen, I don't have time to criticize everybody else. It doesn't build the kingdom. Do we judge truth? Yes. If someone starts saying in some other place, you can go to heaven, but you don't need Jesus. No, we're going we're gonna to judge truth. Amen. But even then, we're not going to name call That's right. and villainize and demonize as if somehow God loves me more than he loves that person. That's not the heart of God. That is pride. And James says, there's no room for it on this team. There's no, that's how the world lives. We look different. He goes on to say in verse 12, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right? I want you to read that with all the sarcasm you can muster up. What right do you have to judge your neighbor? Right? I know sometimes we can lose the translation in the Greek, so let me give you the, uh, just a clearer definition of the, the Greek translation here. James is saying, knock it off, dork face. <laughs> Come on. What are you doing? You're shooting at your own team. Shoot at the enemy, not your own team. He's saying, stop it. Don't do that anymore because at the core is pride and God opposes the proud. He gives us a warning. He says, don't do it. I think James is a smart guy. I'm gonna do what he says. So we judge truth, not people. But, 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 but if I don't judge them and if I don't point out their error, then, then, then no, no, God's got it covered. He's got it covered. Be like Nehemiah. I don't have time for that. I'm building the wall. I'm building the kingdom. I'm leading people to Christ. I'm showing the love of God. I don't have time to pick out the faults in everybody else. I'm gonna show the love of Christ to everyone because that builds the kingdom. That's his first warning. The second warning he gives us is in in verse 13 and it's about self-confidence. He says, look here, you who say today or tomorrow, we're going to a certain town and we will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. What you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Amen. How many of you have a calendar? Right? I've been on my phone. I've got it on my computer. Uh, how many of you found that your calendar fills up quickly? Yeah. Is there anybody else besides me? Sometimes I look at my calendar and I think to myself, what? Who filled up my calendar this way? I don't have time to breathe. Who did this to me? And then I realize, mm, I did it to me, right? How many know it's easy to set up a lot of plans? How many know what you're going to do this week? I know tomorrow I'm traveling to Ohio. And I'm going to come back Wednesday night. And then Thursday, I'm leaving to go somewhere else to visit some family. I've got plans this week. And then later this month, I've got some plans to go back to St. Louis and visit my parents. And July, I'm going on vacation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Vacation. Right? I've got plans. We've all got plans. Is James saying that planning and calendars are evil? Is that what James is saying here? I don't. I don't think that's his intent. Is he saying it's wrong to plan ahead and to dream? Is he saying it's wrong to look ahead at where my life is headed and and simply map it out? That's not at all what James is saying. Let me tell you what James is saying. He's saying this, make sure every plan is made with God and for God. That's what James is saying. 
He's not saying it's wrong to have a calendar. He's not saying it's wrong to have a plan. He's saying it's wrong to have a plan that doesn't have God's input. And listen, why? Why? It's like James knew what it would look like in 2021, right? Because what do we typically do? We typically create our plan. Then we present it to God, not for his review, for his what? Blessing. God, here's my plan. I've thought it out. I figured it out. This is what it looks like. I've thought of everything because I'm pretty sharp. I don't know if you knew that, God. I've got it kind of figured out. I got this plan. Here it is. I don't need you to review it. I already took care of it. Just put your blessing on it. And God goes, well, I've got a few questions. No, 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 God. No, no, no. Trust me. Trust me. Trust, trust me. I got this covered. <laughs> He's like, don't think you do. And then who do we get mad at when they don't bless our plan the way we told him to bless it? You see, God has never committed to bless our plans. He's committed to bless his plans. That's why James says, it's not wrong to have a plan. Just make sure that you're not randomly making up plans that have nothing to do with God and leave him out of the equation. Make sure that your life, in another way, let me say this. He's saying to us, don't forget you have a purpose that's bigger than your plans. God saved you, redeemed you, restored you, healed you, brought you back to life so that you could have a real life, not a little bit better version of the old life. He's saying, don't forget that. Stay focused on who he wants you to be. And he just knows. James knows the tendency of of human thought. It's arrogance and pride. Our natural tendency is not humility. Our natural tendency is to try to be God and try to make God in our own image. And the reality is scripture says we're supposed to be made in his image, not him into ours. So what do we do? What does that look like that we make sure every plan is made with God and for God? It means you wake up every day and you just say, God, I don't know what you wanna do in my life today. Here's my plans. If you like them, great. And if you don't, scrap them. Let's do your thing. God, I'm not saying you need to get up every morning and say, well, God, I just want to know, should I go to work today? I can witness to my neighbor. Yeah. That's not, what I'm, that's not what it means. God, well, I just felt like the Lord told me I shouldn't come to work, but that you should still pay me. That's what I felt like the Lord said to me. No, that's not what this is about. It's waking up every day and saying, God, I've got my plans, but really they mean nothing unless you bless them. My plans mean nothing. I'm willing to throw them out the window. I'm gonna go to work today. This is my thought. I'm gonna go to work. This is what I think I'm gonna do. But if I get there and you have something else for me to do, you know, I kind of realize that I have nine hours of work to cram into an eight-hour day and I'm gonna keep my door closed and keep my blinds closed and I'm not gonna talk to anybody because I got a lot to do. That's my plan. But God, if you would rather my door be open, my blinds be open. I have two conversations that you wanted me to have. And by your grace and empowerment, I fit nine hours of work into six. I'll take your plan. I surrender it to you. I'm going to buy a house. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy a house. That's what I do. Did you ask God about it? I'm just saying, he says, just make your plans with God and for God so that he receives the glory for every thing you do. What does that mean you have to do? And I have to do. We have to humble ourselves before him every day. Every day I bow my heart low before him and I say, God, you're the king of my life. You are God. I am not. What you say I will do because you're in charge of my life. Then James how many, how many ever had someone take a cheap shot verbally? Cheap shot? James takes a cheap shot with his next verse. He follows it with this. He says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So he says, when you take that moment and you get before God and you say, here's my day, here's my life, it's all yours, whatever you wanna do, whatever you wanna say through me, whatever you want done through me, whatever you wanna give through me, whatever, whatever you want, I'm yours. And then driving down the the exit ramp, you see the homeless person sitting there with a sign and the Holy Spirit prompts you to give them five bucks. And you're like, "Mm, I don't think so. It is sin. 
But the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt give $5 to homeless man at the end of the exit ramp. But if the Holy Spirit says, and it doesn't violate the known word of God, right? Because that's, this is generosity. That doesn't violate the word of God. He says, you should do it. But I don't like it. I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. Well, let's just go back to first grade then. Because that's what we sound like. Right? I don't want to do that. Well, yeah, I'm sure you don't. Because our pride doesn't want us to. But when we're humbled before God, we go, what's five bucks from the one who gave me every dollar I have? If, if he can give five through me, I'm just going to listen to what he says. I'm going to have that conversation, even though I didn't want to have it, because I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to have it. And if I don't have it, I'm missing it. And I'm not doing what he wants me to do. Everybody take a deep breath and say, thank God that's over. That warning's over, right? Who needs that kind of talk all the time? He gives us a third one. So just make sure every plan that you make is with God and for God. Does that make sense? Third warning is a warning for the rich. He says this. He says, and a final word to you arrogant rich. Take some lessons in lament, in lamenting. You'll need buckets for your tears. Very visual, isn't it? When the crash comes upon you, your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you've piled up is judgment. Now, I don't know about you, but I just sat back after reading that and go, I am glad he's not talking about me, <laughs> right? Right, because he's talking to rich folk. <laughs> those rich folk, those people that are rich, that's who he's talking about. Well, okay, let me ask a question. Do you have access to one meal and clean water today? Do you have more than one set of clothes? Did you drive here in an automobile? Hmm. Um, do you have a roof over your head most nights? Let me ask a deeper question. Does your car have a roof over its head? Oh, wait, it doesn't because you filled the car's space with more stuff? Right? I don't want you to feel guilty today. Hear me. There's no guilt. But can we come to the place where we can just admit it? We're rich. Can we just admit it? Just say it out loud. I'm rich. Just say it one more time. I'm rich. Oh, isn't that freeing? I'm rich. Oh, I'm rich. I'm rich. Rich, 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 filthy, stinking rich. Right? Why do I say that? One billion people in the world live on less than $1 a day. Half the world lives on less than $5.50 a day. Now, I, I didn't say they only had $5.50 a day for Happy Meals. That's not what I said. $5.50 times 30 is the total amount of money they have every month for every expense in their life. Half the world. I don't want you to feel guilty today. I'm just challenging us, and James is challenging us. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, you have, you have lived for pleasure. Lived for it on this earth. And lived luxuriously. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. James gets to the heart of the matter right here. He's saying this, and I want you to hear it today. I'm gonna to say it again. There's no guilt in this message. He's just trying to warn us. He's saying, if we're not careful, we will allow the blessing and the favor of God to become our purpose, our focus, our entire life's meaning, and we will become arrogant and prideful by living in his blessing and not thinking of anybody else or even thinking of him. He's saying, you've lived for it. 
not lived with it. How many know it's one thing to live with money and it's a different thing to live for money? It's one thing to live with a boat. It's another thing to live for a boat. It's one thing to live for a car. It's another thing to live with a car. It's one thing to live for a retirement plan. It's another thing to live with it, right? There's a big difference in how we live. And he's challenging. I love the visual here. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. He's like, it's like the cow out in the field, just eating grass. Oh my gosh, look at all this grass. Oh my gosh, look at all this. He's getting fatter and fatter every day, forgetting that the faster they get fat, the faster they go to the slaughter. Because the thing that they're focusing on is temporary. We had cows growing up when I was a kid, not a bunch, just uh, enough that we always had one cow that was being ready to be taken to the meat processor and a young calf that was getting ready to eat that grass and get fattened up. And let me tell you a little lesson I learned about the cows on our five acres of property. There wasn't any need to name them. I didn't need to get too attached to them. Why? It was temporary. Their stay in our field was temporary. Now, if you're for with PETA today, I love you. You can have only any opinion you want. People ate, eating tasty animals. That's what that stands for, PETA. I, I'm going to get an email. And so... What I learned is this, don't get attached to those things that are temporary. They're only there for a while to sustain you for your greater purpose. They're not, the, the cow wasn't there for me to invest my life in it. The cow was there for a small period of time to sustain my purpose, to live for God. And I would just challenge you today. I'm going to ask the question, is it okay to be rich? Yes. It's not a trick question. It's okay to be rich. Is it okay to enjoy pleasure? Yes. yes. Is it okay to save for retirement? Yes. Okay. So then what is James saying? Very simply, put your trust in God alone. God alone. And the easiest way to break that is by honoring him with every dollar. Honor him with every dollar. If you don't want money to be your king, then don't worship it. And if you don't want money to be your God, then don't bow down to it. He's saying, don't let God's blessing become your stumbling block. Don't put your trust in things that are temporary. He didn't give you money so that you could live for it. He gave it to you to support the purpose that he has for your life. And in the process, he allows you to enjoy it. In the process, he allows you to have part of it to do fun things and enjoy this life. But at any moment, our heart gets turned to the money instead of the God who blessed us with it. In any point, our heart gets turned to getting more instead of gathering more people for the kingdom. Then something has shifted in our heart that God never intended for us to do. It's okay to have stuff. It's not okay for stuff to have you. If there is any physical thing in your life that you can't imagine living without or giving up, I can't, I can't give up my house. I can't give up my house. I can't do that. I can't do that. No, I've got to have it. That's my security. Then what's your security anchored to? Something that a tornado could blow away in 30 seconds? Everything I have is God's. Several times in my life, God has asked me to give him everything in my checking account. And I thought, is that you, God? <laughs> is that really you? And then I gave it. I'm still here because he's the God of the blessing. He's the God of the favor. He's saying, don't live your life chasing after stuff. If you're here today, I just challenge you. It's not even the message, but I just challenge you. What kills the pursuit of money? The giving away of it. And scripturally, the starting place is the tithe. It's giving the first 10% of everything God gives you. It's the dime on every dollar. You say, I don't, I don't like that. Well, do, you, do you like the fact that God gave you the dollar? Because anything you have is because of the goodness and the grace of God. But I work hard. God gave you the strength to work hard. 
but I got a good job. God gave you that job. You see, he opposes the proud. He's blessed you with that if you have it. And now you're in the midst of a test to see if you will honor him and anchor to him and not the money and not the possession. So I challenge you, if you're not tithing, dime on every dollar. When, when I get paid every two weeks and I break out my budget, the first dollars go to that, that little envelope where tithe comes out because I'm gonna return to God. And that's the, that's the wording in Malachi. Return to God what is his. I'm not giving him something, I'm returning it to him. The dime on every dollar. And let me tell you, the beautiful thing about that is when I do it, I can walk away going, oh God, you're my provider. And then other times he says, hey, I want you to give this to this missionary. Okay, God. Hey, I want you to give this money to church planting. Okay, God. Because every time I let go of what's in my hands, they're open to receive whatever he has next for me. I, we pray, God, give me more, give me more, give me more. And God's like, I, I've asked you to release what's in your hand first. Release what you have and let me give you more. Real faith. We're going to come back to it. The anchor point is visible through humility and honor. The way that we submit our lives to God and the way we live it out in honoring other people around us every single day. What is humility? It isn't thinking less of yourself. It's not thinking that you're worthless or of no value or no meaning. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's simply thinking about yourself less. It's about seeing the other people around you. It's about not, there's something beautiful about getting in the place where you know who you are in God. You know what he says about you, that you don't have to work to earn your value or favor from other people. There's something beautiful about knowing that it's not what I do that determines my value. It's what God has already done and said about me. And when I can get to that place and when you can get to that place, we finally reached a place of humility where now we can honor others. What does the scripture says that we're to love our neighbor? It doesn't put a period there, does it? Love our neighbor what? As ourself. If you don't love yourself, no wonder you don't love your neighbor. You have to know who you are in God. We humble ourselves and then we honor others. We go on, the scripture says, to do unto others what we would have them do to us. That's how we honor others. It's not seeing anyone around you as inferior to you. It's believing that everyone bears the image of God. And that how could I ever dishonor someone who bears the same image that I bear? They may not recognize it. They may not even be Christ followers. Come on. Every human was made in the image of God with an identity that we can honor regardless of their behavior regardless of their words, regardless of their actions, not just believers, but people who are far from God, not just my politician, but every politician. Right. Well, I don't agree with that guy. So I, it's, it's okay for me to call him a dirt ball, scumbag, sleaze ball, worthless piece of garbage that I hope goes to hell. No, it's not. Amen. You're not going to be able to back that up with the Bible. No. I didn't say you had to agree with him. I said, you have to show honor that I'll speak life-giving words even if I disagree with them. We don't just show honor to the people who have the same color of skin that we have. We don't just show honor to people who grew up in the same culture that we grew up in. We show honor to all. You see, listen, I can, I can admit, I disagree with a lot of people. I disagree with Christians. I disagree with pastors sometimes. I disagree with people that I work with. I disagree with people in general. Anybody raise your hand, just say a lot of days. I just disagree. How many of you ever found yourself like me? I, some days I disagree with myself. <laughs> we, but, but I disagree. So no, we, I've, I've said this, this is my prayer with God's help. I refuse to dishonor people with my words or actions. I don't care what they do to me. I don't care what they say to me. I don't care if they say that Jesus is the devil. I'm going to show honor to them 
because Jesus in me demands that. And my question is this, church, what would the world look like? What would happen if you and I chose to put on humility every day, wear it, humble ourselves before God, and say, my day is yours. My words are yours. My interactions are yours. When I feel like I'm going to give somebody the bird in traffic, nope, God, my hand is yours. I'm not going to do that. Lord, when I feel like saying that stupid idiot, no, I'm not going to, no, not God, I'm yours. I'm going to humble myself. And then we honor people. All of a sudden, those people who are far from Christ that don't have a problem with Christ, they just have a problem with the followers of his that they've been around. All of a sudden they go, Oh, it is real. Oh, there is a different life. Well, there is hope. I didn't see it in those people who wore the Christian name tag, but, but now they're not even just wearing the name tag. They're just pouring it out on me every day. They're showing me love and they're, they're building me up. And every time around them, I feel better about myself. They just, and they make me, I say, I look at it and go, God, I want to, I want to be like them. And what they don't know is what they want is the Jesus in you. But how are they going to see it if we walk with arrogance and pride and dishonoring words? Well, they did something stupid. Shall we pull up your list of stupid things? God's grace is given to people who humble themselves. And so James warns us, I want to lay it before you again. And now I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal in your heart where he might want you to change. He warns us against a critical and judgmental heart or spirit, especially among believers. Service is too long. The music is too loud. I can't believe they picked that song. I can't believe he said it that way. Pastor's hair, he needs a haircut. Why did he show up with that? Destroys the kingdom. Well, they read from the King James. I don't like the King James. They read from the New Living Trans. I don't like that. If you don't read this version, you're going to hell. Doesn't build the kingdom. Wearing jeans on the stage. God bless him. I can tell you right now, John the Baptist didn't wear jeans. You're right. They didn't have jeans, you dork. He wore a toga. That's not what you're wearing. Right, come on. Do we have a critical heart? A critical spirit toward our... our... Anybody can pick out problems. Mature Christians come alongside, put an arm under the person and say, let's go. Let's do this together. Let's walk together. Is it a critical spirit that God may be challenging? Is it an arrogant overconfidence in our lives that we're just going to plan our own way and do our own thing and really we just need to be submitting to God? Are we getting sidetracked? Listen, it's so easy to get pulled into the the purpose of the world, which is to get more stuff, to chase fame, to chase money, to chase stuff, right? That's what the world does. But that's, we're not, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. We have a different way of thinking and a different approach to life that he's called us to. Has the pursuit of stuff and the, the hold of money grabbed you in such a way that church is only what you do on Sunday? And your faith is only what you do for an hour and 10 minutes on Sunday? James says, that's why I want to warn you because I don't want you to get tripped up. As you stand with me all across the room and we just take a moment to ponder what we've heard and how it may apply to us as you bow your heads and just close out the noise just for a moment of everyone and everything around you, would you say as your prayer right now, Holy Spirit, What do you want to say to me right now? What are you trying to show me? What is it in this message today that you you need me to receive and do something with? It might be a change in my thinking. It might be a change in my behavior. It might be a change in my attitude. It may be that I need to pull up anchor from other places I've dropped anchor of trust and I'm going to place my trust back in and upon you. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Because I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts today about how we can become stronger in the mission 
of showing and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. And James says, deal with the junk so that you can live out that mission well. If you're here today, and just as a sign between you and God, just an admission that he's still working on you. If you'd say, I hear this message today and the Holy Spirit has identified a few places or one place that I need to grow, change, and mature. Just lift a hand right up and right back down. So many hands across the room because we're just being honest. Every one of us has a place to grow here. So can we pray together? We're gonna ask God to reveal even deeper the things that he wants to change and to give us the strength to humble ourselves, to view ourselves the way he views us and to love others the way he loves us. Father, that's our prayer today. We just take a moment, a moment in this service, not just to come and hear a talking head and sing a couple songs and walk away believing we've done something life-changing. We're at the moment of life change right now. Holy Spirit, shine a spotlight in our hearts of anything in us, any place in us where humility is not the description of that place of our heart. God, any place where there's pride, any place where there's arrogance, any place where there's self-trust or self-reliance, any place where we've decided to put our hope in something else instead of you. And so, Father, we just take this moment and we just choose to bow our hearts low before you not in symbol of us being nobody. Lord, we know that we're somebody in you. We bow down to you because you are the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. You're the Savior of our soul. You're the hope of our eternity. We bow out low in worship to you because you alone are worthy. We humble ourselves. We humble our plans. We submit them to you today. Father, we don't want to do anything that doesn't have your stamp of approval and input on it. God, we submit our plans to you. Lord, we're not going to be critical anymore. God, we're going to speak words of life and hope and encouragement, and we're not going to get hung up on those little dumb things. We're going to build the kingdom with our words and our actions. And God, today, we're thankful for every blessing that you've given us, but Lord, we don't serve you to get your blessings. We serve you because because you are so good to us. And we're not going to live for the blessing. We're not going to live for the money. We're not going to let our hearts be turned away from our true purpose to show and share the love of Jesus. So we humble ourselves and we choose to honor you and we choose to speak words of honor to others and we choose to build up, not tear down. That is who you've called us to be. That is the training that James seeded into our hearts and lives today. And God, we receive it because we know it'll make us stronger in you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you are encouraged by the message and will use what you heard to further deepen your relationship with God. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content.